Hi class. So uh, I have put together this instructional video to help you prepare your oral presentation. Uh, close the door here. Make sure it's nice and good sound quality. Uh, I pressed the record button to get this far. And now I'm going to push the share screen button at the bottom of your, um, your, your Zoom application. And with that, it'll bring up a window asking you which window or application you'd like to share. So you should click on either your PowerPoint or in my case, the first JPEG that, uh, of my presentation that I put together. So I'll double click on that and it should bring up my first image here that you see. And with that, I'm ready to go. So today I would like to present the artist and work of Hans Koper. And I'd like to do so by framing it with the concept of form and function and its relationship with utility and sculpture. So this first cup here is a styrofoam cup and it's an extreme version of utility because it simply does its job and nothing more. It's a styrofoam cup. This next cup by Doug Peltzman uh, is a beautiful high fire porcelain, uh, ornately designed. You can see it has a lot more sculptural quality about it. The transformation from the extreme version of a cup in the styrofoam cup. And this here is an extreme version of a cup on the other end, which is a departure from the styrofoam cup. This is by Ron Nagel. It's heavily textured, very heavy on the bottom base, and has this architectural-like handle. But just by looking at it, you can tell it wouldn't feel very good to hold it because it's, it pinches your finger and all the texture would not make it very utilitarian friendly to drink water out of or any liquid for that matter. And so that's the way I like to frame Hans Koper's work in that his own work also gone through this transformation from utilitarian into the sculptural. Hans Koper was born in Kemenis, Germany in 1920. His father, Julius Koper, was a very successful entrepreneur. However, with the rise of Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany, he was persecuted by the Gestapos uh, to the point of desperation where tragically Julius Koper committed suicide. Uh, this theory is that he was trying to protect his wife, Erna, who was not Jewish. So hopefully they would spare her. Young Hans Koper escaped Germany in 1939 at the age of 19. And, but he was arrested by Britain as a, a German enemy alien and sent to Canada, where he worked in uh, an internment camp. He pushed on to survive by joining the British Army and where he worked uh, digging, digging ditches in the trenches and uh, set up camps in very harsh conditions. He worked so hard that his vertebrae fused into a condition called ankylosing spondylitis. Fortunately, he was discharged from the army in 1943 and where he was assisting in a pottery shop run by, picture here, Lucy Ray. Lucy Ray is 20 years older than Hans Koper and she is a well-trained potter and uh, they both develop a lifelong friendship and partnership. And uh, picture here. And this is a candid shot of them working in the studio together. Uh, by all accounts, they had a completely platonic relationship. And I'd like to read a quote from Hans Koper. Practicing a craft with ambiguous reference to purpose and function, one has occasion to face absurdity. More than anything, somewhat like a demented piano tuner, one is trying to approximate a phantom pitch. One is apt to take refuge in pseudo principles which crumble. Still, the routine of work remains. One deals with the facts. This is a shallow bowl made in 1950 by Hans Koper. It's very simple, elegant with a relief design. This is a square bowl in 1951 with graffito on the outside edge. This is made in collaboration with Lucy Ray. It's titled Three Pieces of Breakfast Set. You can see this transformation, this development of Hans Koper's skill as a potter to serve utilitarian functions. Uh, this is how you can make a living as a potter, to make pots that people can use, uh, but at the same time bring aesthetic value enough uh, so they don't want to use them. This here you can start to see even more of that sculptural quality and that it's very figurative by the exaggerated handle that is jutting out. And this year, the tall jug in 1954, this is 
even more figurative by the way it's leaning. We call that contrapostal. This is the most famous contrapostal example by Michelangelo in the Statue of David. A little art history lesson there. Shoulder triangle form with flat circular rim on cube base in 1975. So this is much later in his career. I would say the sculptural transformation in his work is now complete. This is still technically utilitarian and able to hold water as a vase, but it really is a sculpture. This is a goblet form on a horizontal disc. So this reminds me of a, a belly dancer, very figurative. These three here, cycladic arrow form on cylindrical base. You have no idea how many times I practice saying that word, cycladic. Cyclatic, say that fast three times. Anyways, there's three of them here uh, and it's very, very sculptural. Uh, I can almost argue that there's zero consideration for its utilitarian function because the opening is so small, even though it technically still is a vase because it can hold things. The main body of this piece here uh, comes to impossibly skinny connection with the base, making that base point into the direction of the main body. So it acts almost like a pedestal helping you uh, uh, focus on the main body. And also interpretation referencing the, his contemporary, the sculptor Alberto Giacometti, his, his sculpture here, of gone figures. And this last image of Hans Kolper's work is my favorite. Um, very simple, elegant, balanced, and smooth. Any little pits there he highlights with manganese dioxide, which unfortunately may have contributed to his demise uh, with ALS disease. I would like to read uh, finish by reading his uh, quote here. The wheel imposes its economy, dictates limits, provides momentum and continuity. Concentrating on continuous variations of simple themes that become part of the process. I am learning to operate a sensitive instrument which may be resonant to my experience of existence now in this fantastic century. It's so poetic and lovely in that he is describing how he operates as a potter to concentrate um, on what he can control. And particularly the last sentence where he says, in this fantastic, fantastic century of paradox, because in reality, he lived through the most barbaric and violent century in humanity's history. Uh, I find that to be incredibly inspiring and uh, that is the end of my presentation on Hans Koper. And um, hopefully that's been helpful for you to use a story to narrate your images and uh, be able to help you with your, your oral presentation. So thank you so much for your, you watching this video. Anyways, I'm going to press uh, stop sharing and stop recording. So thank you very much.